Hey everyone, this is John from Kindred Spirits. We've got another interesting look back with an interview with Tori Huster. This is interesting because, again, 2021 season, there was a lot of things to come, and we talked about her role with the Players Union and also her long and storied career with the Washington Spirit. I think we can all say she was sorely missed last year as she missed the season with an Achilles injury and recovery. Hopefully she's back in 2023 with the Spirit. Hope you enjoy, and we'll be back next week with another episode. back ladies and gentlemen uh this is our k refugees podcast you have john you don't have ted uh and we're here with tori houster uh washington spirit defender midfielder anywhere uh they put her she's ready to rock tori thanks for joining us yeah thanks for having me so i am i'm somewhat loath to be cliche and ask the obvious question about longevity with spirit but i'm going to because it's sort of where i think that people that are new to the team or new to new to following the spirit um you're the one you're the only one left from the team that made it to the finals in 2016 um, and that's 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 the the closest to success the team has been from a from a full season perspective. So talk a bit about what it meant to be part of a team that made it that far. Uh, what that team was like, obviously very talented roster. If you look back at it, it's extremely impressive. Uh, but sort of talk about that year and and how it fits in your your long term uh, tenure with the team. Yeah, I always get this question. Um, you guys are starting to make me feel old, but. Um, it's fine. I'm happy to answer it. I uh, I have enjoyed being with the spirit for as long as I have. It's um, it's a unique situation that we have in our league, and I am so thankful, um, grateful to be here, and that they believe in me and all of that. But um, to be a part of a, a squad like that in 2016 was really something special. Um, you have games all the time where you know, you feel like you're right on the cusp of winning and you just can't get over that hump. And that team certainly could. It was like, we won games we probably shouldn't have won. Um, and it was it was fun, really fun to watch Crystal Dunn's response to not making the, was it the World Cup or the Olympic roster at the time? Um, she really just went off that season. And I mean, in my, in my opinion, and I think a lot of others, she's one of the best players in the world, um, if not the best player in our league. So um, it's been a pleasure to have played with her, I think. And now playing against her is definitely a challenge. Um, but yeah, that, that group was, it was really fun. We had, we had a good balance of older and younger players, kind of similar to, to this year. Um, and making it that far was certainly warranted. We, we won our fair share of games and um, did really well and really a bummer to, to lose out in that final game and in penalties. Right. The worst thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I apologize for the longevity question making you feel old. The good thing is you are younger than every podcaster that you're going to probably have a conversation with. I, <laughs> other than Fred Briant, I think I'm I think I'm senior to everybody on both of the teams that we cover. So uh, follow up sort of that question. You, you're playing at Segra this Friday. You yep. played at Audi earlier this month and in previous years. You're about to be a tenant at a new training facility in Loudoun at some point, eventually. No one's actually seen what's inside of it, but eventually you assume it will be better than current where you're where you're at now yeah um talk talk about the changes you've seen in the player experience off the field since your first day obviously the league has changed leaps and bounds but as a particularly a washington spirit player talk about what it's like to be a rookie that day your first day first season and now what it's like sort of with this much broader uh, ownership group and, and and the money around the team yeah i think they uh the ownership group has a number of ideas as to how to make our player experience better um, it could be anything from, you know, providing breakfast foods, a variety of breakfast foods in the morning um, in, in, in at Audi in our locker room before we head out to, to the field. Um, or with Michelle coming on board, um, she allows us to kind of get a, a little more sense of culture. Um, the other, I think it was two weeks ago now, um, we went and experienced an opera gala which there was live opera at this gala. Um, so I think there's a certain like educational piece that we, we maybe get from, from Michelle. Um, and then there are certain, you know, soccer operations that the captains are trying to, um, you know, provide feedback with Steve, with Larry, our CEO, um, trying to, you know, just 
raise the bar um, and be really detail oriented uh, as far as making it a professional level experience um, and kind of, you know, not, not allowing the players to have any excuse for poor, for poor performance, um, right. which is, you know, in the world of women's sports is sometimes easy, but we are, we learn how to push through regardless. So. So let's, let's talk about, let's turn to the field. I think after your man of the match performance last, this last weekend, it seems like the spirit media, myself included, are sort of consolidating around you as one of the most valuable players for, for the spirit so far this season. You've played a number of different positions and somehow you've made each one of them. I feel like look like your best one. Mm -hmm. I think you've looked really strong in midfield when you, when you've gone back and played sort of a right back and a four back or one of the, I think, have you played one of the three center backs in the, fi in the, in the three man? I'm trying to remember if that's not this, happened at all. Yeah, not this year. Um, more of like the wing back in if we do play a three back. Either way, you're, you're all over the place this year and you're doing really well in every position. Um, how are you feeling about this year so far? Uh, has there, was there anything different as far as preparation? You had a sort of, you know, obviously a very strange season last year. Yeah. Uh, not a lot of games, uh, lots of, ended, lots of sort of confusion around. Uh, what the season was going to look like. You knew going into the season what it was going to be, basically. You knew the Challenge Cup. You knew you were going to have the world's longest preseason in, known to man. Uh, you went through that, and now, you're, and now you're in a regular, regular season. So what, what do you account for, for the way you started this year? Honestly, back in the fall after Challenge Cup, I made the decision to try to fix my Achilles. Um, I have struggled with Achilles tendonitis for several years and was able to get a procedure that helps calm it down. I still deal with it from time to time, but, um, it helps calm it down enough to where I felt like I got to a good place for that 10 week preseason period. Um, and then further on in, in the season now, um, that was a tough decision though, because I think as tough as the entire year was, I really wanted to be a part of whatever the fall series or games in the fall looked like, but it something, I guess, um, made me feel as though it would be a good time for a break um, as far as for my in entire body, but specifically for my Achilles. And that was a really hard decision to make as a captain on the team and um, just considering all of the struggles and challenges that we were going through last year. Um, but I do believe that that put me in a better place to come in fit and healthy um, at the start of February, or I think January, we had a small group here that that was training. It got me prepared better physically and, and mentally. Um, I think that answers the question, right? Yeah. Oh, it does. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, the Olympics are coming clearly. Yeah. Uh, the spirit will lose a few defenders, uh, with Sayori, Kelly and Emily departing. I don't know if they've departed yet. I think they, have they left yet? Yes. Yeah. I think they're gone. Yep. Um, how do you feel the defensive unit is going to take to this challenge? I know that we talked to Tegan, uh, last week and maybe the week before about how excited she is about the opportunity to really see the field. Yep. Um, but players are going to get more of a chance to shine. What, what, how are you, how are you looking to this part of the season knowing that you're going to be short a few players? I think knowing that the Olympics was here um, or was going to be uh, present in the middle of the season this year, but then also considering that we'd have challenge cup, we'd have 24 games and then hopefully we'd have three postseason games, two or three postseason games. Um, you had to look at it as a, a marathon. So we were going to need everyone. And I think the staff did a really good job of recruiting players um, that were going to really fill out the squad nicely and could pop into any position that they needed to at any moment. Um, whether we're missing Kelly and Sonnet or Sawori, uh, potentially, Ju uh, no, I think Julia will go as well to um, with the Swedish national team. Um, when we lose those players, there are players that can back them up right away. They can step into a role, um, whether that's along our defensive line. We have plenty of defenders. I think even looking at it back in January, it was like, all right, we're just getting defenders. What's going on? <laughs> um, but we have, you know, we have a lot of attack minded defenders too. We have midfielders that do that defensive role. Dorian Bailey is like a perfect example, but man, she's killer in the attack too. She can really like thread some balls through and um, get our, get our attack started just as well. So um, I think we are pretty well-rounded and I, I, we need to get points in this period because, because we're so well-rounded um, I think this is our chance to really pick up some, some points and put ourselves in a really good position leading into the fall. 
yeah, Natalie's another one of those players that yeah. sort of played right back. And but I, I don't remember who it was this year already, but one of her assists this year over the top was just to, yeah. was on a dime. I'm trying to remember what goal, goal that was, but yeah, th- this team. I, I don't remember who I was talking to on the team about sort of the incredible positional versatility mm-hmm. of like half the team. Half the team is like I am very comfortable playing every single place. I think it was Paige. Paige, Paige was like, yeah, I can play forward. I played forward. <laughs> I can play back here. I could I can play anywhere. I can do whatever they want me to do. So I thought that. Calm was, down, Paige. I, yeah, well, <laughs> listen, she's. I don't blame her. Everybody right. wants to be a forward sometimes. Yeah, of course. Um, let's talk about, uh, this is already sort of spotlighted on, on Black and Red. United did a good post about this, but let's talk about the interception you made that led to Trinity's goal uh, in this most recent game. Yeah. Uh, talk about what you saw in front of you. So uh, Victoria Pickett was obviously shown for the ball, but if you watch the tape, like it wasn't, o- to me, it wasn't obvious that was where the play was going, but you got a head start there. You got a head full of steam, got the interception, played the ball through and, and the goal got scored and, and the three points were. So t- talk about what you saw in that play and sort of that, the importance of that anticipation on that spot in the field to be able to really, you know, turn the game around and, and sort of get the counterattack going quickly. Yeah. I think if you, if you watch that clip back, you'll notice that Dorian basically does the same thing I do just from the opposite side. So I think with her pressure, I mean, initially as the play had started, center backer out there outside back had it she could go long or she could come back in midfield I felt that there was space in front of me for their midfielder to pick it up we probably didn't close the space as well there um, at that particular time but knowing that that was really her only other option Dory and I both stepped and because Dorian was able to step from the side that she was facing she thought she had an easy out um, probably didn't feel me coming at all she wouldn't I wasn't close enough um, until the very last second um, but I think it was equally both of our, our pressure that led to the interception at all. Um, if Dorian hadn't, she probably could have spun out or just gone back the same way she, she came. So, um, it was kind of, it, it was good pressure. Systemic probably, pressure. Right. Yeah. Probably more so from Dora than, than for me, but Trin, man, she, as soon as I picked it up, it was like her, her immediate run forward was. I think what led to the actual goal. Um, if she hadn't run or if she hadn't anticipated me anticipating that, that um, interception, then she doesn't get in behind as easily. Maybe she does because she's so quick, but um, she, she really did a good job to, to cut that back and, you know, score with her left foot. But let's talk, let's talk about her for a second. I, I feel like it's, it's, it's wild, really, to watch her and sort of see how quickly she has become comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, Richie, from the start, was like, you know, we got to take it slow with her. Like, she's she's very young. The tactical part of the game still needs to come. I think the physical gifts and the ta- and, and the technical ability, like, everyone's sort of just like, well, yeah, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> we, there's nothing we could say about that. But she is, in the last couple of games, really coming on strong, particularly with Hatchie unable to play or not be able to start. She's, she's picked up the load already. Her and Ashley Sanchez, I believe, are the second highest in expected goals in the league. So from two young from from a player uh, who didn't actually get a college season or college experience at yeah. all and came in and then and then uh, Ashley who had a very weird truncated Russia uh, uh, rookie season and is yeah. now they're both just tearing it up. So talk about what you see from her and sort of how um, you know was it obvious when she came in that this is this is where she was going to fit in uh, in the league and sort of their her skill set or, or are you were you surprised after you watched her through the Ch- challenge cup and so and so forth? Yeah, um, I hadn't seen her too much prior to um, us signing her. I was surprised we were going to sign somebody so young, um, but I think she came highly recommended from maybe some U.S. soccer coaches um, and really giving her the opportunity at the professional level maybe when college wasn't her thing. Um, I think that's something that maybe you'll see more often, um, coming in. I think we, you know, we started out pretty slow, uh, going Washington football team, um, indoor bubble. Um, it's kind of hard to tell there things were tighter, more controlled. Um, but then I think when we went down to Florida, one of our first scrimmages, she came off the bench, first touch goal. So easy. And it's like, um, we could have something here and this could be, this could be pretty fun to watch um, play with and also watch on the field. Um, She's so instinctual. She presses very well. Um, And I think that there, you know, she, she does have a bit of raw, just raw talent overall, but I think um, if she, I think she's in the environment to, to help with this, but if she's willing to, uh, be coachable and, you know, soak up anything that 
Um, our, our coaching staff is telling her even just to tweak her game by, you know, one, two, three percent. I think she could be, you know, a phenomenal player moving forward. Um, she is really fun to play with. And I think she, you know, you see the relationship that's formed between Ash and, and Trent. They're always looking for each other and they combine really well. Um, now it's just about how do we combine, you know, if, if one of them's not on the field, can we still, can we still do that? Um, and I think just overall as a group, we're constantly looking at how we can improve. And I think, um, they give us really good options as individual talents and trying to merge that into some of the other stuff we're trying to do as we move forward, I think will be. Um, just another weapon that we have, but she is, yeah. she is a great player. Yeah. Trinity really helps stretch the field. I think when it's, when it's just her, as yeah. far as her speech likes to get in behind, I think when she's playing with, with Hatchy, it's sort of a, a maybe a different dynamic. I think they they both create challenge or, or matchup challenges. I think for center backs because yeah. of their size. Yep. So it's, it's, it's really great opportunities for, for, I think, uh, you know, all the chances created this year, that was the big thing this season was how, uh, how will the team manage all of the chances created? Like the, the system is intended to create a bunch of chances from the wings and right. up the middle. Yep. How do they finish? And now it's starting. I think the reward is starting to come. I think even at the beginning of the season, goals were not coming. I think as frequently as they was the team would have hoped. But yeah. um, challenge cup. It's just a, I, I, I like asking this question. I th- I asked Andy about it. I think she was probably more honest than she wanted to be about it. Uh, <laughs> Richie Rich, Richie Richie is sort of taking a. a, 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 a one foot in, one foot out approach to this thing. Maybe it go, maybe it ha- needs to happen at a different point in the year, uh, rather than at the beginning, going full speed, going you know, preseason to full speed, then to like, all right, now we have to manage a full regular season. Uh, you had your you had your midfield Cruyff turn assist. I believe it was an assist. <laughs> I assist uh, to I the like, assist, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> the assistant to the assistant manager of assists. It was a, it was, <laughs> it was a great, it was a great play. I remember that. That was sort of the. The the off the the you know the the main offensive element of that game. I think that was the Louisville game at yeah. home. Mm-hmm. The empty stadium. That was a weird experience for the media and for you, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the tournament? I think last year was an undeniable success because of sort of COVID and only game in town and brought really great attention to the league. This season, um, it was good. Obviously, it was good to have. I think it's great there was a champion of it and all all those things. But uh. What do you think about the future of it from a player's perspective and, and, and everything else? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think it, I will start by saying it serves a purpose. It's something different mm-hmm. than the regular season, something different than the playoffs. I think from a player perspective, it provides a another thing to, to vie for, um, to try to win. So it, it is very competitive. I think at the beginning of the season, players in our league don't know how to have a preseason tournament. You know, they're, everyone is guns blazing. Everybody wants to win. That's just, that's our mindset and mentality mm-hmm. always. And it's always going to be, um, is there a space for it? Some, how like a European cup, how some European leagues do it, where it's, it's spread out a little bit more. I don't know. We, as players, we've also talked about, um, potentially having it, uh, geared towards a cause of some sort so it would be like i don't know i'm gonna throw something out but it's like racial injustice cause or a um childhood cancer cause um something behind it that also gives it another purpose too um from a marketing and business perspective Mm -hmm. um i think that could be kind of cool and you know the league can run with that if they ever hear this podcast but um sure i'll pass it along yeah (laughs) Um, but I think it is, I think it's fun. I think it's entertaining. I think, you know, we're trying to, to market ourselves as much as possible. We want that for the league too, but, um, at the beginning of the season, after a 10 week preseason, that's tough. It's tough on players. Um, there were a number of games that were included this season that, um, players didn't know about until last minute. And that is, you know, that's tough too. So that's not good. We don't like yeah. that. <laughs> that's, not, that's not great. From a player. I, I think the hope, yeah. right. I think the, one of the things we talked about when I was talking to Ashley about it is that an open cup would be cool. Like, a, yeah. I mean, obviously you guys would, I, I would imagine handle WPSL and USLW leagues teams pretty, pretty handily considering mm-hmm. you guys are the best league in the world. Uh, but 
I, just from a standpoint of like a little bit of intrigue, a little bit of like playing teams other than the same few that you guys, because the league's obviously still in a growth mode. Right. So it gets you some new opponents. That would be cool. That would be a, that would be a nice alternative, particularly if you're trying to do an in season, and it would get fans would get to see games twelve to nothing <laughs> or, what, or whatever the whatever you guys against an amateur side would right. uh, would would net. But um, let's talk. Uh, so the the team has had three occurrences. This season where they've conceded less than seven minutes after they've scored uh, or taken the lead late even. Yep. I asked Richie about this, uh, sort of his thoughts on why this is an early trend and what can be done about it. And he talked about sort of uh, talking with uh, some coaches back uh, where he's from about sort of what, what they've done to sort of like a mentality focus on making sure you don't switch off. Obviously the cliche, but the most dangerous time after you on in the game is after you score. Um, but another one of the other media members asked if like you youth of the team could be a factor in that lapse in mentality. Obviously the team is not entirely young, but it is decently young. How do you diagnose it? Sort of what's your, what's your, what's your diagnosis of what this is going on? And, and if it's a hump that you're getting past as a unit already, or if it's something that you continue to focus on and making sure that you stay 110% switched on, at least after you score in the 75th minute. Right. Um, I don't know if I would chalk it up to the youth on our team. I think when it's happened, there have been mistakes that, um, gosh, I hate to throw her under the bus, but Aubrey threw out a ball. She's yep. one of the older players on the team. She threw out a ball in the Orlando game and she knows she made that mistake. She won't make it again though. So I think that is the difference between mm -hmm. an older player and a younger player learning from your mistakes. Um, I think in the Louisville game, I don't know. I mean, we were, we went down two nil, but um, there was a ball that ended up, it ended up being a transition from one of our corners and I'm responsible for organizing the defense, um, on those transition moments. And I didn't do a good job of that. Um, learning from that, that hasn't happened again this season. Hopefully it, it doesn't now that I say that I'm jinxing myself, but, um, I think that is something that we want, we've talked about, we've talked about not conceding, um, I think when we scored either the first or the second goal, I think it was the second goal in Kansas city. I made eye contact with multiple people um, that were on the field saying next five minutes. Yeah. Right. And I think we there all, we all got it. So I think that's, what's important. It's not so much that, um, you know, tying it up um, or having Orlando tie it up at home in the last couple of minutes or whenever that's happening in Chicago too. Um, it's still early, but we need to learn from it. And that's kind of the message we're driving home as, as players and some of the, the, the older vets. She won't want it, but I will give Aubrey the, it was 1000 degrees in her brain had to <laughs> quickly melted for one second. Yeah. Uh, excuse, Cause that game was, that game was not fun. Yeah. Um, you're the player association president. Uh, what does that mean for you in terms of work? sort of off the field, how often are you handling those union issues and how often are you in contact with the league about uh, issues that the players are bringing to you? One of the probably uh, most proud moments this year um, or accomplishments is hiring a full-time executive director for our players association. Um, her name is Megan Burke. She has a load of legal experience, but is also a former professional player too. Um, so honestly, she was the perfect person for the job. She handles a lot of the day to day. Um, that's not to say I'm not doing something every day. So today I I'm creating the newsletter that will go out to all of our players with current updates um, and you know just like little player perks that they can they can use Podcasts if they want. Yeah, to listen to. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll send it out. Um, but being also a year where we are going through CBA negotiations, um, all of us with our board of rep with our board of reps and then our executive committee knew it was going to be a large task and pretty time consuming. Um, but ultimately it's something that needs to get done. And we're working with the league to, to kind of, you know, find, find middle ground where we need to and um, get a contract that, that really is, you know, good for the players, um, good for the league. And it's going to be a long process, but it definitely requires a lot of time um, off the field. Luckily, it's stuff I can, you know, do from the couch and do from bed. It's right. Zoom calls and all of that, but it's it's a lot. How's the dynamic with the sort of the player? This is sort of a new, this is a new, obviously you said CBA process going on. Uh, statements in public have been really um, 
even handed, very much like this mm-hmm. is collaborative. And they always say that, right? Like every every players association league says this is collaborative. We're going to f- strike middle ground, whatever. But it seems like they all both parties sort of understand where the league is and its financial health and its growth perspective and what it's trying to be in the next five years. Um, the players, obviously, we don't know what the what you guys are working on as far as your list of proposals, but. Um, it seems like everyone has a very reasonable perspective of what can what progress can be made, where are we still short, where can we improve in the near term, and then where we want to be. Right. Um, as you like, you said you've hired someone to do the sort of the day to day stuff. But what is from your from your perspective, is the league being a very collaborative partner? Do they does it does it feel like a does it feel as collaborative as it, as it sort of has been portrayed publicly as like this is this is not going to be super loggerheads where we're talking about work stoppage. It's more about how can we get to where we need to be as fast as we can get there. Yeah. I think we all went in with a mindset that like, let's do this together. You know, um, the league really wants this to be a career that players that they want, that they, you know, they come out of college and they're excited about, Um, you know, financially um, we understand that there's still a need to sustain this league long-term. We're not trying to break anybody's bank. Um, The league understands that too. So there has been um, this mutual understanding on both sides for, for the most part. I think there are certain issues and I, I won't get into them because most of it needs to remain confidential, but yep. um, for the most part, y- you can see some, you can see some topics that, you know, could potentially get contentious or maybe that's not the right word, but things that we would butt heads about. Um and I think that's a little bit a ways away right now. I, I feel like we're more in an education phase, um, providing some pers- player perspective on why this works for some players, why this works um, to have clubs more involved or, um, you know, why just, you know, why something is good and why something's bad. I think at the league level, um, you know, with Lisa, she's, she, she knows that she's not a soccer person. She's been in sports and she's been, um, with the Olympic committee, but, um, really understanding what her, the players in the league are, are going through, I think is, it still feels like we're in that phase because we haven't gone through every single proposal that we've given them yet. Um, if that makes sense, I wish I had more to no. report at this time, but. That's um, fine. No, I think that I think from a salary perspective, like that's obviously still continues to be a sticking point. Yeah. And I think from a from an external standpoint, as an observer of the league and a fan and a, doing what I do, like it when you see players continue to have to, I mean, they, maybe they want to, but play overseas in the off season, mm-hmm. continue to play year round, so that they so the checks keep coming in and they're in a better position. Lots of sort of like you know. Not necessarily side hustles, but there's oh there's very there's a very um, entrepreneurial spirit of of an NWSL player that you don't necessarily see everywhere. You don't see in, in men's leagues necessarily. You don't see in other leagues across the world. So from a money perspective, it seems like the argument is still very very sound. Like there are players retiring in their mid twenties when they should be in their prime because it's not financially rewarding and all the other things I already mentioned before. So that's that. That would just be from the outside perspective, like that seems to still be the, the real one of the main pain points trying to understand how to make this a career that makes financial sense for people. I think Paige talked about she's like, I could have made five times more coming out of college with my first offer of a job. And I'm doing this as like a labor of love versus this is it's turned into what it's turned into now. Obviously, she's happy with her choice, but like that sort of initial choice. It shouldn't necessarily be like, well, I'm just going to roll the dice here playing in the best league in the world as a, as a professional soccer player. I hope it works out for me. Otherwise I got to go work at a bank and that'll be better. So <laughs> yeah. I feel like, I feel like that, you know, obviously that's, you got to get there, right? That's the, the end goal is to make sure that everybody who's good enough to play here is not trying to moonlight and not trying to have to have to come up and do other things that they don't want to. Right. Because right. it's it's those certain things, those hot side hustles that take away from potential per, good performance on the pitch. So um, I think we would all like there to be a livable wage. I think um, Megan has done the math. It's almost nearly a third are sitting at or near the minimum salary. And if that's the 33 to 36 percent of players are not making a livable wage, um, what are they going to say to future players, you know? So I think we just, we want this to be a career that, that young players can be really excited about and um, don't have to 
worry financially um, if they're going to be okay once they do retire. If that makes sense. Yeah. Two more labor questions. These are, yeah. these are for whatever reason, this show likes to, even, no matter what league it is, this is like an area that at least I personally like to get, I like to dig into. Okay. Um, I think fans want to know, I've seen this other way on, on social media and stuff. What can they do? Where does their, where's their money best spent to help the league progress, help the players specifically, but even just help the league sort of grow, making sure they're, they're watching on Paramount plus I'm sure helps yeah. season tickets. But like what, if they had to do one thing, what would you say is the biggest bang for their, for their dollar? If they want to support the league and the, and the players. Hmm. Biggest thing for their dollar. I mean, I do think media coverage needs to improve dramatically and that really, I mean, chicken or the egg, if, if there's nothing to watch, then they can't watch it. So we need to get us on TV, but then when we're on TV, have people watch. Um, I saw something interesting, um, I think a couple of days ago, maybe a week or so ago now, um, following people on Instagram and Twitter, following female professional athletes. Um, the it, it seems like social media can be a place um, of a little more parity because you can have you know, female followers, they will follow females too. Um, males or females, whatever their preference is. But um, I think that you're seeing social media gain traction from a sponsorship perspective. Um, if you have more followers, then you might be able to get free stuff or be paid to post something. Um, you're financial um, leverage goes up when you have followers. So I would say, go ahead and click follow. Uh, that It helps more than you think that it does. And when people are doing that more and more, um, or it can just exponentially rise pretty quickly. Um, if that's the case, then people do that. Easy enough. I think I think that that's, that's a, that we make sure, click and follow everybody. Yeah. It's a... <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a that's a good way to do it. And then, sort of, my last question is, uh, you know, I've come into coming to the league in the last two or three years, trying to understand the relationship between U.S. soccer, NWSL, the finan the finan understanding sort of the financial backing element of the where that where salaries are paid versus, you know, it's a it's a very co not necessarily convoluted, but there's a lots of roster rules regarding allocated players and all those things. But like, uh, do you think long term? Five years down the road, like, I, correct me if I'm wrong. It, the 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 break has already occurred between U.S. Soccer and NWSL from a governance perspective, right? Is that yes. that happened this this season? U.S. Soccer is no longer the managing partner. Yes, that happened. I think this, I believe this season. So NWSL now owners and operators are entirely responsible for all salaries that of players that occurs, except for the allocated players. Yes, is that except for the allocated players. Yes. Okay. Well, that makes that makes it simple, I guess. the 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 reason I ask, sort of, is there's always a to me, as a push and pull with international breaks, with how the sort of the mm -hmm. schedule is run before when it was like the managing partner is sort of saying, well, uh, we want to make sure that we have all the players we want available for all the games we have, even if they are friendlies, even if they are, uh, you know, uh, I'm talking, the welcome back series where it's after the World Cup, like. There's, that obviously is a big profit generator to make sure that, and then the league was sort of seen, at least to the casual observer, as like a secondary consideration for, for you know, for U.S. soccer. Yeah. Now that that's sort of broken out, do you feel like that will, what does that change? Does that change anything other than just sort of on paper where the where the checks are being drafted from and who's calling the shots? Or does it does it anything else sort of change for you as NWSL sort of stands on its own completely now? Um, I think with the addition of, you know, if they have this thing called allocation, things have gotten super complex for whatever reason. They, they could probably be a the little MLS, more. The MLS model. <laughs> yeah, they could probably be so much more simple than they are, but um, we won't get into that. Um, but I think what could change from a, you know, if, if let's call it a, who, who is on the national team? Um, Alex Morgan. If she's going to be paid by Orlando Pride, um, she could potentially be making, she could get a better contract than the one that she's on with us soccer. Now, I don't know that for sure. I don't know exactly what her numbers are, but, um, if they are no longer funded by us soccer and they're funded by the individual clubs, 
then they could potentially make more money. Now they could potentially make more money overseas, which I think some people are worried about, or we've seen with Sam like, Kerr, yeah. Sam Kerr being a good example. Of Sam that. Kerr, Rose Lavelle. Um, we don't want to lose those players as a league. They, you know, not only are they the best players in the world, but they get media attention too. So that's important to, to keep them here. Um, but I do think, I do think that in, you know, when you look at the men's game, um, men don't typically say that they play for their country's national team. They say what club they play for. So I would like to see with the NWSL being the best league in the world. Um, I would like to see some of those best players saying that they're playing for the Washington spirit and be super proud about it. Um, I think, I think it will get to that point, you know, Kelly and, and Sonnet now are on our team and, they love being on our team. Um, Kelly's in the huddle before she's leaving for the Olympics, like practically with a tear in her eye. <laughs> um, but really just loving being on our team. And that might just be something that's special here. I don't know how it is everywhere else, but um, having some of the best players in the world take pride in in the club they're playing for. And if it's the N- an NWSL club, I think um, that is a win-win for sure. Yeah, I'm a club over country guy. So I'm. Yeah. Uh, that's always been my preference is to have players that really you know, want to be there and be there first. And then we're also on the national team, but this is where my attention is. And two, I think that now I think players are staying in place a little bit longer. Obviously we're about to have more expansion. So I'm about to be a liar again. So players will start to move again. Uh, But that's, I think that's been sort of a change where there aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of use, but there are players that are now having three, like three and four seasons in a row versus, you know, quickly having to go back and forth. So that's, And that's great as a, that, that has always been sort of my concern. Like I want to, as I, as I invest in, as fans invest in NWSL and the particular teams and the way they invest in every team that they follow in every sport and every, in every league across the world, like that's, that's their priority. That's where they want to be. That's what they're giving their all for. Um, So that's, that's great to hear. Um, To wrap up, thank you for taking time. I really do appreciate it. Um, What do you think this team needs to do or get better at? to solidify their position at the near the top of the table. I feel this has been a bit of a wacky season. I think it's starting to normalize now. I think some of the te- like North Carolina courage had a sort of a rough start. They're starting to play better, go towards the table. I don't think anyone expected the pride to be at the top and to have not lost any games at this point in the season yet. Here we are. Yeah. Um, but we're the spirit are in the conversation. They're, they're right. They're right. They're right there in the, in the hunt. Um, what do you guys need to keep doing or, or start doing to sort of solidify that and lock in those top four spots? I think first things first is we're nowhere at our best, nowhere near that yet. Um, There are a lot of improvements that can be made individually um, in little subgroups that we have all over the field. Um, I think, honestly, I think, like I said before, we need to pick up points during this period, during this Olympic period, um, put ourselves in a good position. But I do think that we you know, it has to be on a consistent basis. You have to be good consistently. So while we might pick up points during this period, um, what comes next? And I think always trying to find those little details, fine tune those little details even, um, is going to put us in a good place for the end of the season playoffs. Um, And that comes with, you know, habits. Um, This season is long. Uh, It can be mentally fatiguing. So um, habits off the field are just as important on the field. And the more that we can reinforce those as some of the veterans on the, on the team, um, will consistently do, um, we need to, you know, take advantage of the small 1% changes, um, or improvements that, that need to be made, um, and just be super diligent about it. And you've got that deep roster and Richie keeps talking about an impact player in the summer. So there's, there's, We'll see. That's he's mentioned it a couple times now. He has mentioned it that there's there's money in the bank for for a for a for an impact player. So uh, as the team continues to crest and get better, and you're, that's the that's the the encouraging thing. Like you said, yeah. there are moments it it appears that everything is clicking in inside of a game where you're saying like, up oh, that's the that's that's the team that's going to be towards the end of the end of the season the conversation for the final. And then there's periods where it's not. But if you are still accumulating points while it's not all there, that's the that's the best thing you can hope for. Yeah. It's the worst thing to do is be a building project, but be sitting near this, you know, near the bottom. So that's not you guys. Yeah. So that's good news. So as mentioned before, make sure you're following people on social media. So make sure you are following at Tori Huster. I think that's, is it just at Tori Huster yep. at Twitter? And what's Instagram same? Same thing. Easy. That's, that's, 
best rule of branding is make it simple for people to find you and to follow. So make sure you're doing that. Tori, again, thanks for joining us and or me and uh, and good luck this uh, this weekend or this on Friday. Yeah, thanks so much. Enjoy this, John. Appreciate it. Thank you.